I'm Sandy Carger, and my husband has frontal temporal dementia. My husband and I were childhood sweethearts. We lived in Springfield, Pennsylvania, and I had been dating a senior in high school, and he went off to college. And all of a sudden, I was dateless for the sophomore prom, and Bob and his family had just moved down the street. So the mothers, the wonderful mothers, got together and decided that Bob didn't know anyone. He was in my class in high school. This would be the perfect thing. So they set us up, and we had our first date when we were sophomores, and took to each other instantly. We fell madly in love, and we stayed together until we were seniors in high school. And in those days, you did what your parents said, and the parents said, you both need to go off, get your educations, and then if you're still attracted to each other, madly in love, that's fine, but you have to break up. So we did, and almost simultaneously, his dad, was transferred to Colorado. He worked for the National Forest Service. So they moved. Bob wasn't sure what he wanted to do. He went into the service. I went to school. I had met someone else. In the meantime, was married, had three wonderful kids, was divorced. So we were apart all those years. He married, married a woman named Sandy, and had five children, lived in Colorado, moved to New Jersey, moved to Cleveland, Ohio, back to New Jersey. I was divorced. Twelve years later, there was a class reunion. And I couldn't go, but someone called me and said, Is there, they're doing a yearbook. Can you give us your information? I gave them my information. At the end of the conversation, she said, Anybody in your class you want to hear about? And I thought, hmm, maybe Bob. But I said, what about Nancy Carger? Nancy was his sister. Then I got my nerve up, and I said, well, what about Bob Carger? So she, I got his phone number, his business number. I carry that number around for three or four months thinking, you know, I'm single, I don't want to, I don't want to appear like I'm after him, but there was just something haunting me about it. One day I decided, you know what, I'm a grown woman, I'm going to pick up the phone, I'm going to leave a message. I c called him, called his work number, he was traveling, I left a message. Two weeks later, he called me back. He was in the process of a divorce. We talked for a bit. He said, when I get through this and get on the other side of it, would you have dinner with me? And I said, oh, sure, that'd be fun. We had dinner. The rest is history. So we eventually married in May, and that's, um, that was the love story. And it was just meant to be. And you know, fast forward, we kind of both had been through a lot, and um, we were very blessed in that way. My husband was officially diagnosed with FTD, I'd say, about um, eight years ago. I noticed changes beginning in the year of 2000. My husband had a very responsible job. He was um, the director of a large uh, automobile truck parts division of a big manufacturer. And it called on him to keep 10, 12 balls in the air at once. And he could do that and not miss a catch. And all of a sudden, I began to see him being fatigued. He began coming home from work, telling me that it was too much for him that he was overwhelmed. And I noticed around the house that his, just slightly, his executive function skills were changing, that he was becoming more withdrawn. I noticed difficulty in word finding. He would sometimes see a cat and call it a dog. His empathy, his whole mood began to change. If something happened in the family, um, maybe someone was sick and I would talk to him about it or a friend had something catastrophic happen. It didn't seem to register to him the way it normally did. He had previously been a very warm, compassionate, outgoing person and those things were beginning to bother me as I saw those changes taking place. We had been married in, I guess it was 97, we were married and he, when he was going through a process of divorce, he was seeing a therapist. And at that point, they diagnosed him as having adult ADD. So initially, I thought, well, this is perhaps a manifestation of the adult ADD. And I knew of a neurologist who dealt with adults with ADD. And we saw him, and he sort of agreed with me that, yes, this was the problem. And that it was probably with aging, and perhaps things had become overwhelming to him, that, that we were going to see more symptoms of the ADD. So that's. That was the first opinion that we had, and that was the first sort of label of what this was. But as time went on, it started to get a little worse, and I was uncomfortable, and I thought, something else is wrong. 
He had then subsequently had two more jobs and was laid off twice. The last job, he was in sales, and he's, as I said, very outgoing, very warm, could sell anybody anything. And he would come home and tell me that he was spending some part of the day in Target, looking around, shopping, going to a Walmart, sometimes buying some crazy things that we didn't want or need, and come home, and that would be his day. Some of the things that he does before he was diagnosed, um, I think the doctor asked me, does he tend to look at things, look for things on the floor, or I think maybe I might have said to him, something's really strange because we'll go to uh, Costco or go to the store out on the street at the farmer's market, and he's always looking on the floor. And he could spot a dime if it was across this room under a table. And it's that hypervisualization, which is one of the symptoms that people have. He still does that. So putting all those things together, I just realized this was not ADD at all took him to another neurologist who he then did a neuropsych, had him see a neuropsychologist, and he was the person that said it's clearly something that's degenerative that's going on. But at that point, they really couldn't pinpoint the, the um, specific diagnosis. So probably th about 18 months later, things continued to go downhill a little bit, and I'd had a friend who her husband had seen Dr. Grossman. And I talked to her about it, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go to Penn. I'm going to take him to Penn and see if we can't get a little more definitive idea as to what this is. And that is what we did, and that's when he was clearly diagnosed. The thing that impressed me so much about that was that in the first initial interview, the first visit that we had, Dr. Grossman spent, I think, probably an hour and a half or more talking with Bob. I had MRIs. He didn't look at the MRI initially. He did the interview, did his test, cognitive testing. The very end, he said, I think I know what this is. Let me see the MRI. He put the MRI up, was right there. So there was a sense of relief that I knew what it was and I could now put some framework around it and that perhaps I would then be better able to deal with it. So the relief was one part. Um, I was like a deer in the headlights. I was stunned, the reality of it. At that point, I was told, um, get your affairs in order. This could be, at that point, maybe eight years, 10 years, but try to figure out, get all these things lined up. We can't tell you what this is going to look like. I can give you sort of a, a ballpark explanation of what you might go through. So it was very, very frightening. And then it was very sad. It was extremely sad to think that this man was losing before my eyes very gradually who he is, who he was. So there was there were the constellation of feelings that came about. And I think as I look back and I, I look now, I keep cycling through those feelings. They're never resolved. I'll get to a point and I'll think, oh, I'm through the grief process. Or I'm through being frightened. I'm finished with that. I'm going to move on now. I've accepted it. It doesn't happen because the loss is incremental. And as you go through each loss, you, you sort of automatically re revisit all of those feelings all over again. So it's a, it's a constant process. Even to this day, this is something that I find challenging and really interesting about living with someone or loving someone that has FTD is I will have people say to me, he's fine, there's nothing wrong with him. So it's a very confusing illness, it's a very moving target, but I think the the FTD Center was the key in helping me move forward to be able to get to a point where I could deal with this creatively. Um, the medical information that I received, that was one piece, the clinical aspect of this. The other thing that helped me was that I know, and I knew then, that there was something there that I could lean on. There were a huge group of people that were there with resources and help, not only clinically, the research, but if I had a question, if I was upset about something, the support was just unbelievable. So it helped me to get a hold of what was happening and to move, start to move forward. Bob reacted appropriately and inappropriately. Um, on one hand, there was some denial that there was nothing wrong with him. 
he would say, there's really nothing wrong with me. And then as he gradually came to terms with it himself, I think he was in a state of shock. And I've seen him go through these periods of being depressed and being sad and feeling inadequate about losing his jobs. He'll kind of point to his head and he'll say to people, this side of my brain doesn't work and it's much smaller than this side of my brain. Or I have trouble with words because my brain is funny. And he'll kind of point to his head. And he's still able to do that, so he knows. How much he knows or how much he feels is, again, difficult to read and part of the loss because that point of connection with his emotions is really gone. So I can't, and perhaps that's a blessing in disguise because I think he doesn't feel the total impact, but yet I don't know. It's changed our lives in terms of what I think about the future. I have found myself becoming much more centered on one day at a time. The other thing that has changed is certainly our inability to travel on big trips or I have to be very careful what I, I try to th keep things extremely structured because things work better that way. But I have to be careful planning things. You know, how much can we do in a day or how much can he do in a day? If there's too much stimulation, going to a play, going to the movies, watching television is something that he just cannot do. It's too exhausting. He can't process the content, so it doesn't mean anything to him. And it's been described to me as picture yourself at a party and everybody's speaking French, and you can't. I think our social life has changed in that some friends are inclusive, but a lot aren't because it's hard for them. It's, I hear the same thing with people that have other kinds of illnesses. But I think particularly this because it's awkward. He can be, sometimes his behavior socially is unpredictable. He's very childlike. Some of the things that he does, um, I'm sure people are uncomfortable with. I get uncomfortable at times, not knowing exactly what he's going to do or what he's going to say. So it has really kind of pulled us in a little tighter in terms of our world has gotten smaller. And it's changed the freedom of, say, as a caregiver, my thinking and what I can do and what I thought when I retired we would both do together. And that has changed dramatically. In the beginning, I thought, well, I can do this. I can do this for six, seven, eight years. I can do it. And then you get you know, farther along in it and the more time goes by and you think, oh my gosh, and I know I can do it for eight more years. I still have him. But it's a challenge. It's a moving target. What worked two months ago is not going to work today. And some behaviors might go away and then you think, oh, we're in a different state. They come back. So it's just constantly readjusting and readjusting um, our lifestyle, what we're, what we're doing, what we can do. And I think readjusting for me, um, really, people say to me, oh, take care of yourself. And that's so hard because in some ways, how can you? How can you take care of yourself when you're doing this? But I've learned to really take care of my own spirit and my own head as best I can. And I sort of know now when I'm getting close to my patients are running thin and I'll say to myself, time out. And I've learned if I'm having a hard day and I'm really sad or I'm frustrated or I'm angry, I've now learned just let yourself be that. I used to fight it. And I used to think, I can't do this. I've got to be, you know, I've got to be strong. I've got to keep doing it. And now I just say, okay, go upstairs, take a nap, pull the blanket over your head for a couple of hours. Be grumpy for a couple of hours. Just let it be. And then it, it's, it goes away quickly. So, and it's just kind of then focusing on what am I grateful for? Looking for the positive. And there's a lot that's still positive. In the support group that I lead, I can tell you countless stories of people who have either moved loved ones here, who have been cared for other, in other places, or people that just haven't ventured to Penn. People are over-medicated, they're getting the wrong medication. If I look back to that first conference I went to eight, nine years ago, compared with the last conference last summer, there's a world of difference in the knowledge. That's not happening everywhere. We are just so lucky that it's here. Even though for my husband, and a lot of the people that I know that are in my group, the cure is probably not going to be there in time. Someday it will be. 
And just knowing that, it's really hard for me to describe the hope and the comfort that comes from knowing that this gigantic body, this pool of people from all sorts of disciplines are working so hard on this effort. So that in itself is you know, the difference between hope and, or healing and cure. There's a possibility for healing, and I think that's what's available to us. Maybe not a cure yet. There will be, but there is healing and that's extremely supportive and helpful.